Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Uh, continuing the story of the ancient Greeks, um, today in this video lecture we're going to talk about how Athens, riding high after its unexpected victories in the Persian Wars, became a regional superpower and entered its golden age. But, perhaps through an excess of hubris, that is, arrogance or pride, got involved in the Peloponnesian War with Sparta, which ultimately led um, to the end of Athens' greatness. Um, so, where we left off uh, in class, Athens had just humiliated the mighty Persian Empire uh, in the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, and you better believe the Persians were eager to get revenge for that embarrassing defeat. And in fact, um, the son of the Emperor Darius, uh, the new Emperor Xerxes, began preparing an enormous military expedition to invade Greece and punish Athens. And in his great book about the Persian Wars, the Greek historian Herodotus claims that the army which Xerxes led had about 1.7 million troops and about 4,000, more than 4,000 ships to supply and to support them when it invaded Greece in 480 BC. Now those numbers are probably inflated, but uh, this does seem to have been a truly enormous invasion uh, on a grand scale by any um, standards. And uh, I'll go to the map for a minute, I will come back to this slide, but um, basically the Persians decided to take a land route uh, this time, and so they um, crossed the Hellespont there, uh, marched through Thrace, and then down into Macedonia and Thessaly, into northern, and then into northern Greece. Now, um, the different city-states consulted about uh, what to do, and it was decided to put, make a stand at a narrow mountain pass called uh, Thermopylae. You see it there with the cross swords next to it, just north of Delphi. Um, and the reason why they did this was because it, it was such a narrow pass that a very few men could hold it against a very large army because only a small portion of the huge Persian army could attempt to go through that pass at any given time, and so it did tend to even things up. Um, so, uh, the Spartans assumed command of the defense of uh, Thermopylae, but they really did not get um, much help from the other Greek city-states, partly because the Olympic Games were going on at that time, and some other religious festivals, and so really there were only a few thousand soldiers there to help the um, 300 Spartans. Uh, under their king Leonidas uh, to defend the pass. But um, the Spartans and their allies did successfully depend, defend Thermopylae for some days until a traitor um, whose name has come down to us as Ephialtes, the son of Eurydemus from Malis, went to the Persians and for money revealed that there was a secret pass, pass away around the mountain that the Persians could simply go around the mountain and uh, ambush the Spartans, uh, surround them from the other side, um, which they proceeded to do. And if you, like most people, have seen the movie um, 300, uh, you know uh, what happened uh, next. Um, King Leonidas um, either dismissed uh, all of his allies or uh, just let them go, let them leave. Uh, but a Spartan, of course, never abandoned um, the field of battle once the battle had been joined. That was against their code. It would have been shameful to them. And so the 300 Spartans uh, remained in the pass of Thermopylae and abandoned themselves to um, certain death. And, of course, the Persians did surround the Spartans. They did massacre all 300 Spartans to the last man. Um, very heroic moment. Um, and defining moment in uh, early Western European history, this um, heroic sacrifice of the 300 Spartans at um, Th Thermopylae. And later a monument was put up um, which says, Go tell the Spartans, you who pass by, that here, obedient to her laws, we lie. Well, 
as you can well imagine, at this point the Athenians were terrified. There was essentially nothing um, between the Persian army and uh, the destruction of Athens. And so, um, as they waited for the Persians to sweep down through Boeotia and uh, destroy Athens, um, they did what any self-respecting Greek would do. They went to Delphi, and they sought the opinion of the Oracle of Delphi. And the first time they did this, the Oracle's response was basically, forget it, you know, you people are toast, just give up, surrender. <laughs> There's no hope. Uh, and of course the Athenians didn't like that answer, uh, and so they went back to Delphi a second time. And this time, the Oracle made a very cryptic comment. She said, um, quote, Zeus, the all-seeing, grants to Athena's prayer that the wooden wall only shall not fall but help you. Then the debate began in Athens. What did she mean by wooden wall? Now, of course, if they had just built a wooden wall around Athens, the Persians would have simply burnt it, and it wouldn't have helped them uh, at all. Uh, and so they discussed the matter, and finally decided that the oracle must be referring to the Athenians' navy. And really, the Athenian navy had been built up uh, at the instigation of the general Themistocles, um, the hero of the second 300 movie, Rise of an Empire. Um, and like like so many things in both those movies, there are many details that were not true, so Themistocles did not shoot Darius with an arrow. Uh, but it is true that he was a very important general and public figure in Athens. And um, during the years leading up to the Second Persian War, Themistocles had convinced the Athenians to use uh, money from their silver mines to uh, build about 200 uh, ships for the 300 more ships for the Athenian navy. And so it seemed that these wooden walls, these Athenian ships, um, you see an example of one there on the left, um, were the key to their salvation. And so the Athenians decided, um, as the Persians got near to Athens, to evacuate the city. And they all went to um, the island of Salamis. Um, you can see it there is also cross swords over it there, just um, to the southwest of Athens. The island of Salamis, which is where their ships were um, docked. And uh, the Athenians took refuge there on Salamis. And it was close enough to the city that um, they were able to watch as the Persians did indeed burn Athens to the ground very poignant sight for these uh, refugees, but they had their uh, 271 ships there at Salamis to uh, protect them. And uh, Themistocles uh, did something very clever then. He, he sent a spy to Xerxes who pretended um, to be a turncoat and uh, this spy told Xerxes that the Greeks were completely demoralized, that they were fighting amongst themselves, that everybody was planning to um, leave Salamis, and, and that there would be no resistance if Xerxes sent his navy into the Strait of Salamis, the narrow body of water between Salamis and the mainland, and if he attacked um, the, uh, the Athenian navy there. And uh, Xerxes fell for this. He took the bait and he did send um, his fleet uh, into that uh, narrow strait. And the Athenians, who were vastly superior uh, seamen, of course, these ships were um, powered by uh, oars. I'll just show you the picture again. You had three banks of oars um, with rowers who were, uh, who were propelling the ship forwards or backwards. These were called triremes. Um, and so the Athenians, uh, once again, to <laughs> the shock of the mighty Persians, were able to defeat the Persian navy, destroy and sink many of their um, ships there in the Battle of um, Salamis in 480 BC. And that really was a decisive blow because it put Xerxes in a very difficult position. He needed those ships to supply the huge number of troops that he had on the mainland. Without them, um, the troops simply were not going to have enough food and supplies to carry on the campaign. And so really the victory at Salamis left Xerxes with no choice but to evacuate 
all but uh, a small portion of his army take them back to Persia. Um, and so he left his general Mardonius in charge of the uh, small remaining Persian contingent, which the Greeks then defeated again in the Battle of Plataea, 479 um, BC. And so really, once again, um, the upstart democracy Athens and uh, her allies, uh, Sparta, of course, chief among them, uh, emerged victorious from the Persian Wars, and, and later generations of Europeans would see this as a very important moment in um, guaranteeing, in a sense, the freedom of Europe from uh, the more Asiatic style of government of the Persians. That may have been exaggerated somewhat, um, but uh, there's no doubt it, it was a very important moment when the tiny uh, upstart Greeks were able to defeat uh, the mighty Persian Empire in the second of the Persian Wars. Now, the main consequences of uh, this victory um, fell upon Athens, and really Athens was just riding high. After all, it was her general Themistocles and her navy primarily that uh, had won the victory in the Second Persian War. And so Athens had gained a great deal of um, prestige and really uh, had become a superpower in the Mediterranean world uh, almost overnight. And so Athens uh, set out to consolidate its new status by forming an alliance, a network of city-states allied to Athens that became known as the Delian League. Now, in theory, on paper, the Delian League uh, was a collection of equal city-states who were banding together for military defense. But in reality, uh, the Delian League was an empire that Athens put together. Um, and that became increasingly apparent um, as time went on. Um, so, for example, um, at first, the other city-states had to uh, provide soldiers for the common defense, but over time, usually, instead of providing soldiers, other city-states would simply pay Athens tribute. So, essentially, Athens is shaking down these other city-states for uh, money. Um, Second, Athens dictated to all the members of the Delian League whom they could trade with, and how much they could trade, and what products they could trade. So Athens had complete control of the trade relations of all these other cities. Third, the members of the Delian League had to bind themselves to obey Athenian law, even though none of them were given the privileges of Athenian citizenship. They could not vote in the Athenian agora and were not part of the Athenian democracy. However, they were required <clears throat> in their own city-states to have a democratic form of government. So essentially Athens was forcing all of these other um, cities of Greece to become democratic. And if that sounds like a contradiction in terms, well, it, it is. Uh, really, I, I think one lesson <laughs> of American history is that it, it really almost never works when one democracy tries to force another group of people to become democratic. Uh, some nations aren't ready for democracy, others simply don't want it and would not be happy with it. And so, um, in all of these ways, the Athenians dominated the other members of um, the Delian League. And uh, so you could say in a way that uh, the victories in the Persians, Persian Wars went to the Athenians' heads and uh, lifted them sky high and perhaps meant that they were ripe, that they were uh, ready for a big fall. Um, but in the short term, the uh, Delian League enabled Athens to go even farther down the road to a pure democracy. And this happened under the great Athenian leader Pericles, the most important political figure in Athens between 461 and 429 um, BC. It was under Pericles' uh, influence that the group called the Thetas, uh, who were kind of the lowest class of Athenian citizens, a lot of them were rowers uh, in the navy. And so after the Second Persian War, the victory at Salamis, 
they understandably said, you know, we had a big part in this, can't we um, vote in the assembly from now on? And so Pericles essentially gave them the vote in the popular assembly. And he went even farther by uh, paying um, Athenian citizens who attended the public assembly and also citizens who served on um, juries. And if you think about this for a moment, you can see how important this would be um, to expand the democracy of Athens, to bring more and more people into the, the democratic system of Athens to give them a voice. Because let's say you're a poor laborer, um, even if you have the vote, um, you're probably not going to be able to get off work or afford, you can't really afford to take a day off work uh, in order to go to the assembly or sit on a jury. But if uh, the city of Athens is going to pay you to do that, uh, like modern courts pay uh, jurors here in the United States, then you might be able to afford it and you might be able to participate in politics and law, whereas you couldn't um, before. But it's important to realize that this expansion of democracy uh, to the poorer people, to the lower classes, was paid for by the Athenian Empire, by the tribute that was flowing in from the other members of um, the Delian League. Without that, Pericles would never have been able to uh, suggest this. And so it's kind of a strange but true <laughs> fact that democracy and empire often go hand in hand. And we see that some of the greatest empires in the history of the world have been uh, largely democratic countries. For example, uh, the, the, the biggest empire in the history of the world was the British Empire during the 19th century. Um, and um, Britain was uh, a democracy essentially by that point in time, a uh, constitutional monarchy, but they had an elected parliament and uh, most people could vote by that point in time in, in Britain. Um, and the empire was hugely popular in Great Britain. And also the United States um, although our empire was nowhere near the size of theirs, did accumulate a, a, a small number of imperial possessions toward the end of the 19th century. And the people loved it, and they were willing to pay for that and to profit from it. And so we often see that democracies actually do establish empires, um, strange as that may seem. Um, when we talk about Athenian democracy, though, it's important to realize that um, the democracy was not nearly as open or as participatory as modern democracies uh, are. So in Athens during the Golden Age, um, at any given time, you would have only about 40,000 adult men who were considered um, citizens. Um, and those 40,000 citizens lived alongside 10,000 medics who were mostly business people from other places who were just living in Athens. 160,000 women and children who, of course, couldn't vote, and about 100,000 slaves. Yes, Athens, like most societies in the ancient world, did have slaves. Um, Athenian slavery, Greek slavery in general, was not as cruel as the type of slavery we'll, we're familiar with from American history. Um, mostly it was pretty mild. Some Greek slaves even became very well-educated intellectual figures. Um, that is, unless you were a slave in the mines, that was really a, a lousy way to live and, and really not something anyone would want to do. But other than the miners, uh, slavery in Greece was pretty, pretty mild. But in any case, of course, slaves couldn't vote either. So really, it was a very small percentage of the population in democratic Athens that could actually vote. On the other hand, uh, about half, it's estimated, of free Athenian males could read. And for the ancient world, that was a, an enormous total. And once again, it shows you the uh, power of the alphabet in simplifying reading and writing so that more and more people could um, learn how to read. Well, of course, Sparta, uh, down in the Peloponnese, their region of Greece, was watching all of this. Uh, somewhat begrudgingly. Uh, now, the Spartans really didn't have any interest in being the superpower of Greece. They had their hands full, keeping their helots in, under control. 
so they really didn't want to be the leaders of all Greece. On the other hand, <laughs> they certainly didn't want Athens to be the leaders of Greece either. Um, and so resentment grew up over time between Sparta and Athens as Athens became more and more pow powerful. And uh, in response, Sparta created its own alliance, its own network of uh, allies, including the city-states of Megara and uh, Corinth. And whenever a nation uh, or a people has alliances, um, it's almost certain that eventually they're going to be dragged into some kind of conflict um, through their allies getting involved with, uh, in conflict with other nations. And that is exactly what happened um, here. Um, so in the 430s BC, Athens got into a conflict with Sparta's ally Megara, and for the first time in recorded history they imposed economic sanctions on Megara. That means it was sort of a trade embargo um, that none of the dealing league members could trade with Megara. This is the kind of strategy we use nowadays against uh, dictators like Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Uh, as I taped this lecture just yesterday, the UN passed economic sanctions against uh, Kim. Um, but in any case, this didn't help Athenian and Spartan relations, nor did it help when um, Athens supported the island of Corsaira in a dispute it was having with Sparta's ally Corinth. And uh, similarly, from the other side, one of Sparta's allies, Thebes, attacked one of Athens' allies, um, the city of Plataea. And so, really, almost inevitably, with these networks of alliances, Sparta and Athens were drawn into conflict um, with each other. And so finally in 431 BC, um, Sparta had had enough and proclaimed that it had a duty to liberate Greece from the dominance of the Athenians and launched the great Peloponnesian War, which uh, lasted for 27 years from 431 to 404 um, BC. Uh, however, it's important to realize that the fighting was not continuous during all of those 27 years, and in the early years of the war, it followed a very uh, predictable pattern. Um, now, the Athenian strategy, uh, they knew that they were no match for the Spartans on uh, land. So, in 458 BC, kind of foreseeing that eventually they would come into conflict with Sparta, the Athenians had built a large um, stone wall uh, around the city of Athens, and they had carried the walls out all the way to the sea, to their seaport of Piraeus, which was a few miles from Athens. And so they had created a vast enclosed area within these um, long walls. And so, um, basically, every year the Spartans would invade the region around Athens, which was called uh, Attica, and every year the Athenians would move all the, the residents of Attica inside the long walls, and uh, they would stay there until the Spartans had left. And so the Spartans would, you know, burn some crops and maybe a few uh, house, farmhouses here and there, but that was about all they could do. They couldn't get to, um, to Athens itself because of uh, the long walls. And of course, really what enabled Athens to pursue this strategy was their naval power. So they were able to bring in food and supplies from their allies um, through Piraeus uh, to feed all of these people that were taking refuge behind uh, the long walls. And then too, they could also use their navy to raid um, Sparta and allies or the Peloponnesus in revenge for uh, this annual Spartan invasion. So really, um, the war was kind of a, a, a stalemate um, at first, um, but Athens was certainly holding its own um, and really was not in any imminent danger from the Spartans and uh, certainly had a very defiant attitude. You see that in the funeral oration of um, Pericles, so some groups will be reading this uh, speech given by Pericles um, the end of the first year of the war. This was a kind of a Memorial Day type celebration. It was written down by the Greek historian Thucydides. Um, and it really shows the kind of cocky, defiant attitude that the Athenians had. 
um, toward the Spartans. However, uh, this long wall strategy did have one major drawback. Uh, when you put that many people together in an enclosed space with primitive conditions of sanitation, you're going to have the outbreak of epidemic diseases. And that is exactly what happened in 430 BC when a plague hit the people uh, of Athens. We don't know exactly what it was, maybe maybe typhus, but uh, in any case, this raged for um, several months from 430 to 429 BC, and it had absolutely devastating consequences. About a third of the people of Athens died, and of course that meant that a third of the soldiers died and a third of the sailors died, so this seriously weakened Athens as a military power. And also, um, Athens' greatest leader, Pericles, died uh, as a result of this uh, plague, which was certainly a severe setback for the Athenians. Now, um, it's interesting, you know, the Spartans really had a more difficult task in the Peloponnesian War. Um, essentially, they had set out to liberate all of Greece from Athenian control, and they had to do this without really having a navy to speak of. But Athens really just had to survive and hope that eventually the Spartans would get um, tired of the war. And uh, some Athenian victories in the early years of the war um, did lead the Spartans to conclude a truce in 421 BC called the Peace of Nicias. Uh, and, the, and hostilities were suspended for uh, a few years. However, here again we see the cockiness and arrogance of Athens. Um, during this period of peace, Athens decided to get involved once again in helping uh, a rebellious city-state in Asia Minor that was revolting against the Persian Empire. They sent troops over to help um, this revolt. And once again, that got the Persians very furious at uh, the Athenians. And so... Um, they became willing to help Sparta in their war against Athens, and ultimately that would prove to be a major factor. And so when hostilities began again in 418 BC, uh, the tide really began to turn in favor of the Spartans. In 418 BC, uh, the Spartans were able to ambush an Athenian force um, that, had, uh, that was raiding the Peloponnese and to um, defeat them. And things really just went from bad to worse for the Athenians. Um, one of the key moments of the Peloponnesian War in terms of the Athenian self-image happened in 416 BC. By this point, the Athenians had become desperate to get any kind of advantage against um, the Spartans. And so they decided to force um, the residents of Milos, which was an island um, in the Aegean Sea, to force them to join the Delian League and to ally themselves with um, Athens. And so they sent ambassadors to Milos and they basically said, we're going to make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> you either join us or else um, you die. We destroy all the people here. Um, and um, so the Melians thought about it, they debated it, and they decided um, to fight back. And that was certainly a fateful decision because Athens did defeat the Melians did kill um, every adult male Melian, and took all the women and children uh, and sold them into slavery. And this really caused a kind of crisis of conscience within Athens, because Athens was supposed to be the great open society, the great beacon of freedom, and philosophy, and music, and culture, and, um, and the mind, and so forth. And yet, here they were behaving like... Um, bullies uh, in, in this incredibly aggressive and, and uh, domineering way. And, and the Athenians began to look at themselves and ask, you know, who are we? Is this really Athens? What, what has become of us? What is this war doing to us? And the great playwright Euripide, Euripides wrote a play about this in 415 BC uh, called The Trojan Women. It was supposedly about the war, the, the Trojan War, and the sufferings of the women there. But really, it was about the sufferings of the Melian women and children who had become enslaved um, the previous year. 
And setbacks continued uh, for the Athenians. They did have one glimmer of hope in 410 BC when they did uh, defeat the Spartans at sea, not surprisingly. However, by this point in time, um, the Persians had decided to get involved, and really the help that the Persians gave to the Spartans was the tipping point that enabled them to uh, win um, this war. And so uh, the Spartan king Lysander was able to put together a fleet uh, financed by the Persian Empire. And with this new Spartan navy, um, the Spartans were able to defeat the Athenians at a place called Egospotomy, um, near the Hellespont, that passage between the Aegean and the Black Sea. And um, this was really a cataclysmic event for the Athenians. Their powerful navy had essentially been destroyed, and that meant that without those ships, they were no longer able to bring food in. Uh, behind the long walls. And so there are stories about uh, the Athenians eating uh, rats and even eating each other um, during this starving time. Uh, and so finally in 404 BC, the Athenians had no point, but no, um, uh, the Athenians had no choice but to surrender uh, to the Spartans. And so Athenian pride had been humbled, somewhat like um, the story of Icarus that we had um, in class, and um, they had gotten their comeuppance, and it was a severe one. The Spartans imposed very harsh terms of surrender on the Athenians. Uh, they required that the Athenians completely destroy the long walls, but even more, that the Athenian navy be reduced to only 12 ships, incredibly humiliating for such a great naval power as Athens. And, Finally, the uh, Spartans abolished the Athenian democracy and created a committee called the Thirty Tyrants, who had absolute power to govern Athens after the Athenians' defeat. And now, of course, this left Sparta reluctantly in control <laughs> of all of Greece. And essentially, having won this war, they had no choice but to exercise leadership over the other city-states of Greece. This was a position that they really didn't want, but they had been thrust into uh, through the sequence of events. And so, uh, inevitably, other cities in Greece began to resent the Spartans for their overlordship. And uh, the Corinthians revolted in 395 BC, and it took 12 years for the Spartans to suppress that rebellion. And then, um, the city-state of Thebes finally um, decided to get back at the Spartans. Uh, under the leadership of their general uh, Epaminondas, launched a war against um, Sparta. And the decisive battle of this war was the Battle of Leuctra, which took place in 371 um, BC, um, in which the Theban army took on the Spartan army. And this was one of those uh, only in Greece uh, situations because the heart and soul of the Theban army was uh, the sacred band, which consisted of 150 pairs of male lovers um, who were fighting for each other and for the glory of Thebes. And with these uh, hardened and powerful warriors of the sacred band uh, on their side, the Thebans were actually able to defeat um, the Spartans at the Battle of Leuctra and impose peace terms on Sparta. And uh, really what goes around comes around, and now the Spartans had to suffer the humiliation of having to free their helots. The Thebans knew that without the helots to do the work for them, Sparta would quickly decline to a second-rate military power, and that is exactly what happened. Um, so the, the helots were freed, and from that point forward, Sparta was not a real threat um, to dominate Greece with its military. Meanwhile, back in Athens, um, as often happens when a nation or a people is in crisis, um, there was actually a very fruitful period for philosophy and um, thought uh, in Athens after their defeat in the Peloponnesian War. Because when uh, people suffer uh, the loss of an empire, for example, um, they begin to think, you know, what went wrong? What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? And um, so that led to some very, very interesting um, speculations and theories about politics, for example, 
Um, in the Republic of Plato, that the story of the allegory of the cave is taken from, um, Plato sets forth an ideal society, what he thinks of as a perfect uh, society that looks very, very different from uh, the traditions of Athenian democracy. Um, so Plato says that uh, the, the rulers of this society should be guardians, or as it sometimes is put, philosopher kings. Um, people who are philosophers, who um, are brilliant thinkers, who can set the tone for this society uh, and create a society where everybody is free to pursue the true, the good, and the beautiful. The true, the good, and the beautiful. The goal of uh, Athenian philosophy. Uh, but in order to bring that about, Plato thought it was necessary to have essentially what we might call a communistic society in which people lead a very regimented life, for example, eating at a common table. Uh, even children in Plato's Republic um, that he projected uh, should, he said, be raised communally by the state. So essentially parents had to give up their children to state-sponsored daycare centers and also share their uh, spouses when necessary to have more uh, healthy and intelligent children. And for those of you who are who have the reading about uh, Sparta from Plutarch, this should sound familiar. A lot of these reforms that Plato was proposing were uh, similar to the lifestyle of the Spartans. And so in a way it's not surprising that after the Spartans had defeated Athens that um, Athens greatest philosopher would look to the Spartan example for inspiration on how a state should be. All of this was fantasy and speculation. These um, reforms were never implemented, but uh, became a very important uh, text in the history of Western political philosophy. Coming out once again of that questioning of democracy after the Athenians defeat in the Peloponnesian War. All right. Um, well, Plato was the most famous student of the great uh, Socrates, and in fact most of Plato's writings are dialogues, um, like the Allegory of the Cave, in which Socrates is a character uh, talking about uh, some issue with uh, one of his disciples. Um, and really, the philosophy of Socrates, as Plato presents it, was a reaction to um, a group of philosophers who were known as sophists. And the, the most famous sophist was a man named um, Protagoras. Um, one of Protagoras's most famous sayings was this, man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. If you think about that for a minute, what does that mean? Essentially, uh, who determines what is true good and beautiful. For Protagoras, human beings determined that. Not the gods and not God, but human beings ourselves decide what is true, what is good, what is moral, what should be done, what shouldn't be done. Um, and Socrates really uh, disagreed with that uh, approach. Um, Socrates did not believe in the Greek gods. That ultimately got him into trouble. But he did believe um, in, in a divine being. Uh, in fact, he said that uh, he, <laughs> he had a, what he called a daimon who uh, whispered to him and told him things. This was a spirit uh, who, who told, you know, who kind of instructed him in the truth. So Socrates did believe in the spiritual world, and he did believe in a god. Um, and he did believe in an absolute truth. Uh, however, he did not believe that any human being, including himself, could ever claim to have uh, the complete absolute truth at any moment. Um, this was impossible. And so what Socrates did, his method was simply to walk around Athens and talk to people and ask them questions. And when he met people who had some certain belief uh, that they were absolutely sure of, he would ask them questions until they were not so certain anymore. Uh, in other words, he was trying to tear down all knowledge that was merely human knowledge and to point people towards the pursuit of the absolute truth um, 
in in the spiritual world. So in that sense, Socrates was what we call a skeptic. One of his famous sayings is, I only know that I know nothing. And for that reason, he said he was the wisest man in the world. Why? Because he, he knew that he didn't know anything. Um, well, when you have someone like Socrates walking around in your society, questioning things, questioning people, especially questioning the gods, um, that's dangerous and that is threatening uh, for the leaders of a government. And so the leaders of Athens in 399 BC put Socrates on trial and the official charge was corrupting the morals of youth. Um, in other words, that he was influencing all of the young men who followed him around Athens and, and who talked to him to disbelieve in the Greek gods. And uh, ultimately, Socrates was found guilty on this charge, and he was sentenced to death by drinking a poison called um, hemlock. And his disciples urged him to uh, leave Athens. They, they assured him that they could get him out uh, of Athens so that he would be safe, and, and probably that's true, but Socrates refused to leave. He said he had enjoyed the fruits and the benefits of being an Athenian for his whole life, and it wouldn't be right for him to um, dispute this verdict. And so he drank the hemlock and he died in um, 399 BC, and really became a hero for all those who do pursue truth. And that was true also uh, even later in the Christian tradition. Um, even though Socrates obviously was not a Christian, <laughs> he came from the time before Christ, um, the Christian tradition really admired Socrates and looked, looked back to him and, and labeled him as a noble pagan. So even though he was a pagan, not a Christian, he was considered to be very noble and even a, a kind of symbol of Christ because like Christ, in the eyes of the early Christians, he had died uh, to bear witness to uh, the truth. And so... Um, this is an example of something we'll see later in the course of how uh, Greek and later Roman philosophy would be used um, by uh, early Christianity to try to get its own point across.